Gospel, reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Near the the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this Jesus knew that everything had now been completed, and to fulfill the scripture perfectly he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. We have the readings from the book of Isaiah, and the readings come under the title of Ebed Yahweh. Ebed is the servant of God. Okay. Ebed is a Hebrew word for servant, and there's a lot of, there's a good few passages in Isaiah uh, which speak about this. This is Deutero Isaiah, the second book of Isaiah. There's only one book, but it's divided into this uh, Deutero Isaiah. The whole idea of the servant suffering a lamb, an innocent, uh, no cause to for him to be killed, yet he is. He is slaughtered. There's a lot of torture, there's a lot of pain. Uh, and then the reading for the Philippians, uh, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself. There's a, what the Greek word, the Greek used the word kenosis. Kenosis is an emptying out of ourselves. And the cross does that for us. And then we have the Gospel of John, where Mary is prominent, is given to us as our mother. The scripture that we have chosen for today is Galatians 6, 14. God grant her that glory only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This really has sort of intrigued me for years. Okay? God grant her that glory only in the cross of Jesus Christ. There is another one who sort of qualifies that and gives it some meaning. And again, it's from St. Paul. The cross is foolishness to the Jews and absurdity to the Greeks. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't reason out for people to die on a cross. In the early church, the cross was not a symbol. It was not something that people spoke about until the time of St. Helen in the 300s. The early church, at which the Greek Orthodox still uh, sort of worship today, the empty tomb, the symbol of the empty tomb, meant that Jesus had risen from the dead. But the cross came back into prominence. And if you read in John's Gospel, um, it says, you know, that the confection of the Eucharist or the completion of the Eucharist didn't happen until he died on Calvary. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's some of the, what the theologians say about John's Gospel in particular. But when, it, when we come to speaking about the cross, there's three basic elements that I think might be appropriate. One is, the first one, almost the immediate response that we have, or reaction, I would say, rather than a response. The reaction is what? One of avoidance. It's an element of torture. It's an element of pain. You know, we don't like to talk about the cross because it's sort of, and that's just the first level. Okay. We sort of push it away from us. Yes, it's the cross. Jesus suffered on the cross. There's no doubt about that. And this, no greater love as any man. He went through all of that. What Isaiah speaks about this morning, he went through all of that for us. And most specifically for me. We need to see that happening. When we talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's a, a, an essential element to know that you know we are loved to that capacity, to that capacity of the blood of God. Somebody was sharing with me the other day, he has a devotion to all the blood drops that Jesus shed. It takes three years to do that devotion. That will give you some idea of what supposedly, you know, what they calculate the, the blood drops that Jesus shed. So again, it's that element that is painful to look at. 
The second element, okay, which we're trying to do here today is salvation, okay? Salvation, okay? All is redeemed by the cross of Jesus Christ. All is redeemed. You know, people talk about, I want healing from cancer, heart problems, kidney failure, uh, not being tall, you know? Yeah. <laughs> those things. Uh, we want to, and, and those are out before us. What's inside, okay, has to be healed. It has to be nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. Like what could be inside of us? Feelings of unworthiness, feelings of guilt, shame, you know, I don't measure up, failure in life, all of these things. There's a famous, I have it here, I brought it with me, Saint Faustina. Jesus said to her, my daughter, you have not given me all that which is really yours. And she said, what, Lord? What have I not given you? Daughter, give me your misery. But give me your misery by it, your, uh, because it is your exclusive property. Give me your misery because it's your ex exclusive property. There is no misery that has a match for my mercy. And that's what we need to do, because many times that misery is behind, is behind a lot of sinfulness, is behind a lot of blockages to our healing, okay, to our healing. So to give the Lord, that Jesus nailed it to the cross, and we're sort of taking it away so that we can have Jesus on the cross. You know, Fulton, the great Fulton Sheen said, America has Jesus without the cross, and Russia has, Je has the cross without Jesus. You know? So to understand okay, the power of the cross, we can't do without it. It's that simple. We can't do without it. The Eucharist has power because of the cross. The Eucharist has power because of the cross. And to see it in that way. And the third element is a good element. Okay? which is freedom. I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. Of all the people that should have discovered the power of the cross, besides Jesus himself, Saul was, was not the one to be chosen. But Saul, becoming Paul, was chosen. And he began to see, you know, not in the law, not, you know, in all that Moses, and we've had that in the scriptures for the past week or so, Jesus saying, you don't really know me. You don't know what I'm about. You don't know where I came from. Yeah, we do. You came from Nazareth. You came from Bethlehem. No, no, no. You know, you don't know. I'm, there's a beautiful song, I don't know if you heard, on my mother's side yeah, and on my father's side. Okay? Uh, to understand who Jesus Christ is and the power of his cross. And the power of his cross. Even said to James and John, you know, do you, can you take, the, can you drink the cup? Can you take the cross I'm about to, you know, suffer on? And they said, yes, we can. But they're like us. They have no concept of the power of the cross, the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. You know, we hold on to our sins because, you know, they're part of us. You know, they're forgiven. The mercy of God has forgiven them and yet we hold on to them. We have to nail them to the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's a little exercise we're going to do today. There was a beautiful movie made, oh, some years ago, many years ago. The movie was called Marcelino. Mm -hmm. Some of you know that? Yeah. Two people do, that's just very good. <laughs> it was about a little boy, he was an orphan. He was left on the steps of a monastery and the brothers, the Franciscan brothers, brought him up. And they told him, you know, whatever you do, you know, don't go in the attic. Do not go in the attic. Of course, the little boy, the first thing he wants to do is to go in the attic. <laughs> and he goes in the attic, and there's a big, you know, big, big crucifix there. And he goes, wow. Wow, he looks so sad. And he looks hungry, too. And thirsty, so he goes in the kitchen, steals some food and drink, 
and brings it up. And Jesus comes off the cross and eats with him. And he's talking to him there, talking to him all the time. Mm -hmm. And he, every day, he goes into the end. And Jesus said, what do you want most of all? And he says, I want to see my mom. His mother died in childbirth. And Jesus <coughs> said, well, you have to come with me then. I, I, your mom is with me. She is? Yes, she is. So you'll have to come with me. He says, and for that you'll have to die. And he says, I want to see my mom. I want to see my mom. The power of the love between the son and the mother. And they can't find Marcelino. And they go up in the attic and there he is, dead at the foot of the cross. It's just a beautiful, very touching movie that they made so many years ago. So that's the story of Marcelino. Faustina, St. Teresa of Lisieux, the 3rd of June, 1895, said one, you know, made an act of complete oblation. Complete oblation, which is total offering of her whole life. You know, every, every gift that I have, every temptation that I have, every up and down that I have, every depression that I have, every sickness that I have, she wrote it out and gave it all to the Lord. Give it all to the Lord, you know, and that was t two years before she died, mm -hmm. died in 1897. So, uh, again, to see, you know, what, and it, like when we come to, uh, you know, the baptism of the Spirit, we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but there is no personal relation, and it brings freedom. It brings freedom. It gives us a sense of, you know, being able to move on being able to move on. The uh, Brother Lawrence, who wrote that beautiful little booklet, The Practice of the Presence of God, he's now St. Lawrence, and he said to God, he said, see what happens when, you know, when I'm not with you, when I do my own thing? See what happens when you abandon me? You know, so that sense of the presence of God, <clears throat> and so many times we wonder, Acts of the Apostles, we've got to go through many trials and tribulations, before we enter the, enter the kingdom of God. And sometimes it's personal hurt. It's a, it's a personal, you know, my God, where are you? You know, to, to see that God is nailing that stuff to the cross and all he wants is our permission to do it. Is our permission to do it, to have that sense. And, you know, to take away all of the other stuff, we will have a freedom. We will have a freedom. Like St. Paul says, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. And uh, to, to see that it's a developing process in our spiritual growth. It's a developing process in our spiritual growth. So that it's, it's essential. It's essential. We can avoid it. We can avoid it for, for many years. Okay? But eventually it has to catch up with us. You know? There's a dying, you know, it's John 12, 4. You know, unless a, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. What has to die in us is what is most destructive. What has to die in us is what we think is most constructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see our, the, the tension, the tension that's there. If there ain't no tension there, then somebody else, you know, the pizza guy has got you. you know? <laughs> um, guy with dominoes, never mind that. <laughs> but to understand, you know, the struggle, and, and so many times, you know, giving it to Jesus, giving it all, releasing it to them, and the cross has power. The cross has power, you know, and it has that power really to set us free, you know, to set us free. What we're going to do today, we're going to uh, use this um, uh, prayer of the faithful, and then after that, we're going to have, have you signed, there's a little prayer that we have, we'll say that prayer, okay, um, we'll say that prayer, and you have your, uh, little piece at the end where you can sign your name. They, they sign your name and you bring it to the cross. To the cross. And then we're going to have the laying on of hands. You know, the laying on of hands is the, is the lesson that you have for today in the Bible study. The laying on of hands is very, very powerful. Okay? We have seven sacraments, right? We do. Yeah, we do have seven sacraments. <laughs> 
How do you know your child is baptized? I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do you know your sins are forgiven? I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How do you know you receive uh, Jesus Christ, the body of Christ? How do you know you're confirmed? I conf the bishop says it. I confirm you in the Holy Spirit. How do you know you're married? You don't? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. You take Lulu for your wife? I do. <laughs> you take Josh for your husband? I don't. <laughs> Those are said. Mm -hmm. Extreme unction. I anoint you. You know, with the forgiveness of God. You know, by this holy anointing, may you be forgiven all the sins that you've ever committed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. How do you know you're ordained? I ordain you. No. There are no words said. There are no words said. As a matter of fact, there was some a discussion back around the early 1900s about the ordination of a priest. It's the laying on of the hands that transmit the power, that transmit the, the power of the priesthood. Not a word is said. There are no songs sung or anything else. It's a very significant few seconds you know, in which that happens. The laying on of hands. If you remember the picture, Rembrandt's picture of the uh, prodigal son, there's a hand being laid on the head. Mm -hmm. The laying on of hands signify a blessing. It's a blessing. And especially since words are not said, it, it becomes significant. The, the sign or the symbol you know, receives the power. So that's what we're going to do today, to understand it in that way. The, the blessing that Jacob received was the laying on of hands. That's why Esau says, a very sad situation, he said to Isaac, don't you have any little blessing left for me? Mm -hmm. He had a little blessing left, but he didn't have the laying on of hands because that was conferred by the father on the son. Okay? And whichever son, usually the firstborn son, but uh, Jacob tricked him. So uh, it's in, in that sign, it's the, the laying on of hands. And it's the same, I think, for the ordination of a bishop. Okay? Again, there's a laying on of hands by uh, another bishop or an archbishop. I think it's an archbishop that does it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's what happens. Okay? Uh, for, that's, that's the power of the laying on of hands. Okay? And, and you can use it. You can use it. You know, if you're not ordaining someone. You, know, you can use it. To, so you, you won't ordain your wife if you do that. <laughs> no, no, no. It, what happens is it has this, a sign uh, of power, a sign, a sign of blessing, a sign of power, okay? And it, it's a prayer. It's a prayer, you know. Don't dismiss it as just the laying out of hands. It has significance as a prayer as well. It's a prayer. You're not saying anything. You know, you bless yourself. Sometimes you never say the words, but still you're blessing yourself. Everybody? <laughs>